All right. So, last week and on Monday, we started talking, we've been talking about indexes, we've been talking about various forms of optimization. Uh, in particular, how to uh, take a query and rewrite it into a form that's more efficient to evaluate. The last couple of weeks, we've been talking about indexes and how you can take a selection operator and a file scan operator and combine them using the right data structure to make them more efficient to evaluate. Uh, we've also talked about how you can do the same thing with a uh, join operator uh, combined with a file scan operator. So before we get on to uh, today's main topic, uh, rewriting for joins, uh, let's quickly recap a little bit. So over the last uh, couple of uh, classes, we've talked about a couple of different indexing schemes. Um, give you a chance to wake up a little bit, especially with the crappy lighting. Um, what are some schemes? Call them out. Tree, which, uh, what kind of tree indexes have we talked about? The B plus tree, okay. All right, a hash. Uh, now, we talked about a couple of different hashing algorithms. Uh, so there was, there was the basic build a bunch of hash tables and then use overflow buckets algorithm. Uh, we came up with another one. Can anyone uh, describe to me how, uh, how that worked? So what was the problem we were trying to address when we talked last Monday about, uh, sorry, uh, last Wednesday about uh, hashing algorithms? Uh, can you speak up a little? When you use the wrong hash, or uh, your hash, uh, when something goes wrong with your hashing function? Okay, so there's a possibility that you might end up uh, putting too many hash values into a single uh, bucket. So we talked about at least one other uh, algorithm uh, that was proposed. Uh, can any, anyone remember what that was? So we talked about extendable hashing. How uh, Can you summarize how that worked? Okay, so we stored all of our data onto a set of pages, and whenever we wanted to increase the size of the hash function or uh, add more buckets, we could simply uh, increase the directory page uh, rather than having to copy all of the, the massive number of pages of data that we actually uh, wanted to keep track of. So we've got, um, we've got our basic hash, and we talked about the extendable hash. Now there's a really nice and elegant solution that we came up with uh, to the problem of overflow pages. Uh, does anyone remember what that was? Come on, you guys came up with it. So we've got a big hashing function that produces uh, a bunch of pages and Naively, we end up with all of these overflow pages. So there's a really nice and elegant solution that someone came up with uh, to reduce, to address the problem of overflow pages. Splitting the pages. Splitting the pages. How, uh, how would you do that? If you are addressing it by uh, four, four digits, then we uh, double the size. Okay, so we can add another uh, hash function. We can use, in addition to having this index page, we turn each individual data page into an index page of its, of its own. So rather than having a linked list of these pages, we use this page to figure out, to create a new index, to figure out uh, where the data should be stored. Now, essentially adds another, uh, allows us to store more data. So, 
call this hierarchy. This creates a sort of hierarchy, so I'm going to call this a hierarchical hash. Okay. Um, and of course, what's the simplest possible? Uh, it's not. Let me back this up. Rather than using index, I'm going to use the term access path. So we've got a couple of specific indexes. What's the simplest possible access path that you can imagine? Linear. 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 What do you mean by linear? OK, so just the raw data itself. All right, now let's come up with a quick uh, table here. So um, when talking about access paths, there are a couple of costs that we have to uh, keep in mind. So um, So we might be looking for one specific value. And if we're looking for one specific value, there's some cost associated with that. If we're looking for a range of values, again, there's a cost associated with that. And it might be the case that we can't do anything better. We just need to iterate over all of the values. Yes? All right. Can people see this? Yes. Cool. All right, so I'll, I'll be switching back and forth. Uh, I kind of want to use this room because those chairs really look comfortable. Um, live vicariously through you. I have to stand. Um, OK, so we've got, uh, what do we have? One, two, uh, we've got five different access paths. If I'm looking for a specific value, what cost, what's my cost for uh, B plus tree? Log, so log of the size of what? Uh, if I have a relation, let's call it R, so the size of R. Um, what goes down here? The, the width of the tree. Okay, so let's have, uh, let's call that a branching factor, and let's call that K. All right, what if I'm looking for a range of values? From A to B. I have a low end and then an up end. It's the same? Is it precisely the same or so log K of size of R plus what? Plus the length of the range. So or B minus So I have uh, some number of tuples that get returned. And obviously, if I have to access each of those tuples, I need the, the amount of effort I'm expending is going to be proportional not just to the depth of the tree, but the number of tuples that I actually need to return. What about a full scan? If I'm trying to access all of the tuples in a B plus tree, N? Okay. Uh, sorry, what do you mean by N? Length of R. Length of R. Okay. So what about a basic hashing scheme where all I have is my big hash table and that hash table points to a bunch of data pages and uh, each of the data pages might have a bunch of overflow buckets. Professor? Yes? I have a doubt in the range for okay. B plus tree. Okay. Uh, should it be the value twice of log of R? Because we can, we can find the lowest value and the highest value. So the cost of finding a particular uh, gap. I really wish they had more board space here. Um, okay. So let's go here. So I've got my 
my tree, and that cost is uh, how much? Log n or log log size r. Okay. Uh, how? What do I do next? In uh, what, what would I do next? Find the upper bound. So that. Okay, and then what? So you have to read the values. As I'm reading the values, can can I combine that with that scan? There's no there's no profit of using that scan. There's no value to this specific scan. Okay, so uh, the the question was initially why isn't the uh, why isn't the cost twice log, uh, twice log size of R? Um, and the answer that I just posited was that you, you can combine that second index uh, lookup with, a, uh, with the scan that you're already doing just to return the values uh, in the range. So does that answer your concern? Yes. Okay. All right, um, any other questions on the costs of tree, uh, B plus tree? Yes? Is there a relation between the, the, the K and the size of the hood? Um, in general, the, uh, no, so K, uh, so where, where does K come from? So what does a tree node look like? Sorry? So I've got uh, a bunch of entries in my tree, in my tree node. Uh, what do those entries point to? Uh, can you speak up? Sorry, Adam. Other tree nodes, potentially. And eventually, you get to the actual data. So where, where does k come from in this case? Yep. So it's essentially uh, it's essentially that. Um, and that's basically determined by the page size. So the bigger your page, the more you can fit in there, the bigger K, the bigger K is. Does that address your concern? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? All right, so for a hash index, what is a hash? Uh, if I'm just doing a basic hash index with overflow pages, what, what would my lookup cost be for a specific value? Plus the size of overflow bucket plus four. Oh, one. So plus the size of the plus the number of overflow pages. Sorry. Worst case. In the worst case, yes. What about a range scan? Not possible. So there, there are two different possible cases. Um, okay, so if I can actually enumerate all of the specific values that fall into that range, I can do this process once for every single one of those elements. So two possibilities. Uh, one, um, and What if I can't enumerate all of the possible values? Uh, if I'm using a looking up on a floating point number, a range scan on a floating point number, for example. Okay, so I can still do a full scan over all of the, the tuples. And the, is, is the hash index going to introduce any additional costs there? All right, what about an extendable hash? If I'm looking up a specific value. 
Ov1. Do I ever have overflow pages in an extendable hash, by the way? Yes, under what conditions? Oh, so the answer, uh, so there's never, uh, so if, if I would create an overflow page, I'd add another uh, hash layer. So what if I, 99% of the time, this is correct. There is one corner case that, can anyone see the, the one corner case where that's it? Yes? Did uh, split up to the point that, uh, like the maximum for each of your, let's say if you're, if you're uh, OK, so if your hashing bit. function can't give you any extra bits. Um, you could always potentially add another hashing function that adds more bits. So what if I have a million people named Bob? I'm trying to index on first name. What do you mean by overwrite? The tuple will be the Bob, whatever the next Bob has, the tuple value and tag value will be. Well, Bob Jones, Bob Smith, Bob Dole, Bob. The last one will be remaining. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're, they're distinct tuples. So all of the data has to be there. Um, but if I'm if I'm maintaining an index specifically on the first name, the first name Bob, it may be the case that I have one bin that has a huge amount of data simply because when I do a lookup on that value, I'm going to return all of those tuples, in which case uh, the, the number of overflow pages is relevant only because it's, uh, all of that data actually has to be returned. But in general, um, you can assume that an extendable hash never needs to be, uh, you never need to do more than one lookup for that. OK, uh, what about a, uh, this hierarchical uh, hash data structure that we came up with? If I'm looking for a specific value, what's, uh, what do I need to be looking up? One into the number of hash functions. OK, so. Uh, and how many are we going to have? How many layers? Two. One for the page. Okay. Well, what if, uh, so we, we talked about doing this recursively, because these guys could also potentially overflow. So what happens when, so if we do this recursively, we turn each of these guys into index pages. So how many, on average, what's a, what's a good way of, uh, what would be a good estimate of how, how deep this uh, hierarchy is going to get? Number of overflows. The number of overflows, or the depth to which, to which you are likely to overflow. OK. Um, what, how much you estimate that? Explain that. Uh, because the worst case could be that uh, we are using the hierarchy in a single page. A single page uh, so in the worst page. case, we might need to, we might have all of the, the data values essentially falling into the same bucket. OK, that's potentially uh, the worst case. Um, so what kind of a structure are we creating with this hash index here? A sort of a, a list or tree. OK. That might be a, a good starting point. How many leaves do we expect to have in this tree? <coughs> Can you speak up? The range divided by the number of elements in a single page. OK, so one, so basically the, the number of leaves is on the order of the size of the entire relation. Um, OK, so if we have a number of leaves 
proportional to the size of the entire relation. And again, assume we're, we're estimating here. So the average number, the total, excuse me, the average number of uh, inner nodes, how, how deep would a tree with uh, n leaves be? Well, again, great. So here we've got log size of r. And again, we have a branching factor k because we can put k elements in a single. Um, so what about uh, full scan for both the extendable and the hierarchical hash? How much, uh, how expensive would a full scan be uh, for the extendable hash? So how many data pages do we need to hit? R? Okay. Are we guaranteed? Actually, you know, that, that's, uh, that is probably a good, uh, a good estimate. Um, is there any other information that we can use? Actually, let me get back to that. Um, <clears throat> we say R. Um, and as before, you can simulate a range scan using either of these two different approaches. Um, so what about a, this, this hierarchical data structure? How many, uh, how expensive would a full scan be over this? So how many pages do we need to touch? Which pages do we need to touch? We use this uh, tree metaphor uh, in a tree. Which leaf, uh, which, excuse me, which pages would uh, we need to touch? The leaves. OK, and how many leaves are we going to have in this tree? On the order of R? So, this is actually, um, okay, um, this is, these are both completely correct estimates. I want to get back to them, but first, raw data. If I'm looking for a specific value, what do I need to do? Full scan. What about range scan and full scan? Now, here's a question for you. The, these are all order of magnitude expressions, which means we're kind of killing a constant term in all of them. Should I be using the same constant term for this as I'm using for this? No. Why? Because we are not uh, taking the time for calculation of the hash function and other processing time. Well, now we're just talking about the, OK, so the, the constants in front of these guys are going to be different. Uh, do we need to do uh, to compute any hash function, uh, hash functions for the full scan? We're just hitting all of the leaf pages. In general, do we want to? Uh, so, what might be different between these two? These two cases. Full scan on on recording. And why do you say that? Uh, so, the the response is that the full scan on uh, either of the hashing uh, the hash data sets might be slower. Uh, why would you say that? Okay, and what? How did uh, so the the raw data might be stored sequentially, and how does that impact the efficiency of the scan? Oh, sorry. Uh, so the uh, you're saying that the uh, the fact that the data is 
on a disk and therefore you can uh, take advantage of sequential scans on the disk. Uh, yes, you're completely right. Uh, the, the fact that you're doing a sequential scan over the data would make it more efficient. Anything else different? Yes. Okay. So it would be a bit slower. Is that still the case in the uh, extendable hash? So could you find a way of mitigating that? The answer, uh, the response is that the you might need to go through the index structure uh, in order to find the next uh, the next node. Could you find a way of uh, avoiding that? Okay, so you could potentially link the nodes together uh, into a link, the, the leaf nodes together into a linked list. And that would save you the cost of uh, going up through the tree structure. Okay, so what about the, uh, how much data are we storing in each of these leaf nodes? Are they typically going to be full? <laughs> in general, in a hash function, the buckets are going to be quite empty. So while we're going to have a number of buckets in all of these data structures that's roughly proportional to the number of, uh, to the size of the table, uh, the buckets are actually going to typically be substantially less full than they will if you're just, uh, if you're just storing everything in a big heap. So in general, the, the heap, if you're doing a full scan, the heap might actually be substantially more efficient. Okay, uh, cool. So, let's, let's move on. Um, all right, so we've been talking so far about uh, a variety of different operators, and I'd like to turn uh, towards, uh, turn our attention now uh, to joins. Uh, joins, and in particular, the, the way that we evaluate joins is going to be probably one of the most uh, important things in, in uh, making, a, uh, making our evaluation process more efficient. So the, really the first thing that I'd like to ask is if we have a join operation, join of A and B, uh, sorry, join of, uh, that, that is now on a video, plus there are some backup slides. So, uh, is this? Okay, so, um, if I have a join, join of r dot b plus s dot b, how would I go about estimating the size of this output? Huh? Okay, so I could potentially estimate this as uh, cross product. Uh, R S, so this would be what? Size of R times size of S. Okay, is that a, uh, can I do better than that? Just using the information that you've uh, been presented with so far? Yes, these are R dot B elements which So we scan the size of R. Okay, so we need to know something about the distribution of B. Um, how could we use that? So, initial question, or uh, slightly, yes?
Okay, so we can figure out, we can use the, um, an estimate of the number of values of each B to come up with an uh, improved estimate of the size of this join output. Now what I'm kind of getting at here is um, composability. So what, what is a join? Or put, put another way, um, you're completely right that you can do that estimation based on statistics that we've gathered about the B column. Have we encountered a way that we can use those statistics previously? Where, where else have we seen these kind of statistics pop up? The performance of a query, what kind of, or another way, what kind of queries have we looked at so far? What kind of operators? Selection. Selection. Okay. So what's a, what's a join operation? Cartesian product plus selection. selection. Okay. So, so if we can... If we can come up with a good metric for costing that, we can come up with a good metric for costing this. Okay, cool. Um, and I can skip. Okay, so So really what I want to get across here is that you can, everything that we've discussed so far for selection predicates, you can apply just as well uh, to join operations. And in this, uh, so what was our main working assumption up to this point about selection operations? So what do we assume about the, uh, about data values like R.B? Yes? They're comparable. Um, what do you mean by comparable? Okay. So we're assuming uh, pro we're assuming that the data in here uh, actually does produce some. Uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding what you're you're trying to suggest. Uh, could you rephrase uh, what you mean by comparable? Okay, so you're assuming that there is actually, for every B, there's a corresponding match in... Okay, so you can, you can make an assumption that for every B in R, there will be a corresponding B in S if you have some piece of information about the schema. That B is unique? Okay, so if we have a, a unique key constraint on either R or S, we can use that. Any other properties from the schema that we can use? I, I heard... Uh, I heard the start of an answer coming from somewhere in here. Okay. So we've got unique key, uh, sorry, unique constraints. What other kind of uh, constraints do we have? Foreign key. Okay, so uh, what does a foreign key constraint give us? Uh, what were you, you saying? Okay, so for every uh, every time we have one value in one tuple, there's a corresponding value. There must be at most one corresponding value 
in another relation. So we can take advantage of that. Um, what kind of, uh, assuming we were dealing with just regular uh, floating point data or string data, what other kind of properties could we take advantage of? Or uh, what, are, what other statistics might we want to gather about RB and SB? So call out some statistics here. There, uh, there's some very basic ones, and if you call one of them out, there's, you're probably not going to be wrong. The range of values. The range of values. Okay, so if we have a range, a, a high and a low value, we can get, uh, we can get the the range of possible values that we could be looking at. What other statistics might we, might we be interested in? The number of values. The number of values. Great. So if we have the range and the number of values, what else can we compute? Frequency the frequent, so we uh, using and so we can make some assumptions and calculate the distribution of values that fall into a particular uh, range of values. Great. Okay. So I'm gonna. Wow. All right. Cool. Um, so. I want to take a slight detour from this discussion, um, but before I do that, uh, let's have, it's 5.40, so let's take a quick break and be back here at uh, 5.45. All righty. Let's move on. So um, let's move on to a related but um, sort of connected detour, uh, different but bit of a detour. Um, there, whenever you're evaluating joins, it's the only the join itself isn't the only thing you need to consider. Um, the other important thing is the order in which the join is evaluated. So if I have a query, and let me turn the back to uh, nap time mode. Um, if I have this, uh, this basic relational algebra expression, how many different ways can I evaluate that? N factorial. Minus one factorial, but yes. Uh, so there are uh, 20, 24 uh, different ways of uh, evaluating this plan. And in general, uh, how, how good is, uh, if, if you're doing a search problem, uh, anyone with optimization or, or um, AI experience, if you've got a search space that's uh, factorial in size, is that a good thing? No. no. Um, so what we want to, what's worse is that every time we want to compute the, uh, the cost of one of these plans, that's a pretty expensive operation already. Uh, we have to gather a whole bunch of statistics and use those statistics. Uh, if we have to do that for a factorial number of different plans, that's going to very quickly overwhelm our, uh, the cost of doing the optimization is going to overwhelm the, uh, or be bigger than the cost of actually evaluating the query to begin with. Uh, that's not exactly a good thing. So uh, what we would like to do is have a way of uh, improving, uh, limiting the search space in some very uh, standard way. So a technique that was originally pioneered by uh, the, the traditional, the famed system R optimizer is uh, something called a left deep join, uh, sorry, a left deep plan. And the idea here is that you restrict yourself to uh, a join plan where you're always joining with one additional relation. So if I have uh, those four relations there, I can first join U and S, for example, then join that result with T, and then join that result 
with R. Or I can flip S and R. I can uh, reorder, uh, reorder uh, the order in which I perform these joins. But I've essentially restricted the, the set of possible plans that I could create. And how many different um, orderings can I get? Is it factorial? Oh, sorry. So the, the distinction between um, the distinction between these two uh, approaches, if I have this plan over here, R join S join T join U, uh, I have a very large search space of uh, plans that I could evaluate. So um, I can put parentheses here, I can put parentheses here, I can put parentheses uh, pretty much anywhere. So every step of evaluating this plan is basically going to be picking a new place to put a parentheses. Uh, so I could have a plan that, for example, joined R, joined S, P, joined U. Uh, So the idea here is that you create a fixed template for the join. I have four relations. And so what I'm going to do is limit myself to plans that look like this. If I have a fifth relation, again, there's a very standardized template for the structure of the join, not necessarily the uh, the order in which the tables are joined together, but the structure of the join. Now this has a couple of different um, advantages. This particular style of plan, uh, which is called the left deep plan, has a number of different uh, advantages. Uh, the first, they're not entirely connected, but uh, they kind of work together. Um, so the first is that you're always joining against a single relation. And because of that, you can take what is normally a binary operator and replace it with a unary uh, join operator. Rather than join two operators together, you join with, you, always, you know that one side of your join is always going to be a relation. This helps you uh, not only to cost the, the right-hand side, but it allows you to do things like uh, index, um, index nested loop joins. The other advantage uh, is that so if I'm doing a uh, many of you have by this point implemented uh, some form of hash join in your project. How does how does a hash join or a hybrid hash join work? Or more precisely, how does the hash join that uh, I know a number of people have done this. So uh, how, how does the the hash join that you implemented work? You get inputs from two different data sources. What do you do with those two inputs? Can you speak up? Okay, so you pick the small one and what do you do with it? You hash it. So you build a hash table over one of your two input streams and what do you do with the other one? So you scan the second one. How many times do you end up looking at the second, uh, at any given tuple in the second relation? You've got two relations. One that gets hashed and one that gets So for every tuple in the scanned relation, how many times do I end up looking at it? Once. That's nice. That means that I only 
ever need to look at this tuple once, and I can just pass the results up. I have to look at the, the data in here multiple times, but I only have to build that hash table once. That's kind of nice in this uh, scenario. You build the hash table over R, or over whatever tuple is sitting here, and you just scan the tuples and keep passing them up this chain, always using the hash tables that you've already built on the right-hand side. So, so this is essentially a really nice way of, of performing joins. Um, one other, uh, so the, the two advantages that we've discussed so far, uh, number one, a lot of join algorithms are what we might call half pipelined. So half of the join algorithm can uh, only need, sorry, one of the two inputs of the join algorithm only ever needs to be seen once, which makes it really nice for these, these uh, left deep plans. And the other is that we can do things like nested loop, uh, index nested loop joins. Um, the third one, the third advantage, is that so, does it, anyone know what, uh, show of hands, has anyone encountered the term uh, star schema before? Okay, uh, what is a star schema? Okay, so basically I've got, in a star schema, I've got one table, and that table has four and key relationships with a very large number of much smaller, what are called dimension tables. So we've got one table at the center called a fact table and a bunch of dimension tables. Um, and then we've got four and key references out to those dimension tables. So for that kind of a, uh, for a query, uh, frequently we'll encounter queries that essentially ask us to join the fact table with the dimension table. Or more precisely, do a selection over the, over the dimension table and then join the result of that selection back with the fact table. And that really, really nicely fits in with this left deep plan. So OK. Um, that is. All right, one last thing on joins, and then wrap up indexes. So we created a big table of costs for the various types of indexes we could create. Now let's do the same thing uh, for the join algorithms that we've come up with. So what are what are the join? What are some join algorithms that we've uh, discussed so far? Hmm? Nested loop join. Nested loop. Anything else? Block nested loop join. Hash join. called the hybrid hash join. Anything else? Index nested loop join. OK. That is one other one that I'm So we didn't speak about it that much, but uh, does uh, does everyone remember sort merge join? Anyone care to uh, describe how that works? Yeah. So you have two uh, two tables, and you first sort them on on the join attribute, and then 
and then you can basically merge them together, and you're guaranteed that the join uh, the join columns, because they're already ordered, are going to be in the right place. So you only have to look at the head of any of the list at any given point in time. Okay. So what about uh, costs? So what kind of costs do we normally consider? Just testing to see if you're awake here. <laughs> I/O cost and. Working set size. Okay. All right. And I'm going to put one other attribute here up. See if we can uh, pipeline each of these. Uh, and what I mean by pipelined is I only ever look at a tuple from either side. A fully pipelined operator is one where I only look at any given tuple in my input exactly once. So, okay, nested loop join. How many, what's uh, the I.O. cost of a nested loop join? X, what do you mean by X? For a single nested loop join, sorry. N, uh, N squared, uh, what are, so let's say I have two tables R and S, I'm computing R join S. R S. So how many times do I need to read in, let's say R is the, the bigger relation, my outer loop relation. How many times do I read that in? Once. Okay. So I need to read uh, at least the number of the full number of blocks in R once. Um, how many times do I read the inner relation? Size, uh, the number of blocks, or how many times do I read in all of S? Size of R. So, size of R times the number of blocks in S. That's kind of big. Um, what about the working set size? How many times, uh, how big is my working set? So one tuple on the right hand side, one tuple on the left hand side. Uh, technically, it would be two blocks, but but you only ever actually need one uh, two tuples. And is this pipeline? Yes. Yes or uh, yes on the left. Yes on the left. So. All right, block nested loop. Yes. Nested loop just use the pipeline. What do you mean by uh, what are you trying to mean by pipeline? Uh, I mean by pipeline, I mean that for so a fully pipelined operator is one in which I only ever look at any tuple in my input once. So I never need to reset to the beginning of that stream. Um, and in this case, for a nested loop join, the outer loop. I only ever look at any outer loop tuple one, precisely once. All right, what about block nested loop join? What's my I.O. cost, first off? Defined by the block size. OK, so let's say I'm reading in one block at a time, or one page at a time. For both sides, yes. Hmm? Uh, sorry? Uh, uh, R divided by S? Uh, OK. So is that it? No, what else? So I need to read the, each block in S once for every block of R that I read. What else do I need? Plus R. What's my working set size? Two blocks. Can I get any smaller? Um, 
Is it pipelined? And what about the hash algorithm? I/O cost. How many times do I read in uh, the data from R? Once. Once. So I read in all the tuples from R, and what do I do with S? Again, the same thing. What's my working set size? Maximum or uh, what's um, where? How are you getting maximum? Or what is the motivation for picking maximum? So, what's the the big component in the work uh, in the working set? The hash. So how do I pick which, um, ideally, uh, assuming I know everything that I could possibly know about the, the system, which would I pick to hash? The smaller of the two. So min size of R, size of S, although in the worst case, we might get the max of this. If we pick wrong, um, and is it pipelined? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so this one is kind of weird. Um, it does only look at every single tuple exactly once, but the limiting factor is that the working set has to fit in memory, and if it doesn't, then um, this ends up this algorithm just flat out doesn't work. All right, what about an index nested loop join? So let's, let's say S is the indexed relation. How many times would I read a tuple in R? Once. Okay, so I have to read every tuple in R at least once, uh, exactly once. And then what's my cost? For every tuple in R, what do I do? Find the corresponding tuple in S. And what's the cost of that? Constant or number of tuples in S? It's another one of those instances of my famous phrase. Yes. yes. Um, so, but more precisely, what does it depend on? Yes, so how is S indexed? So if S is, uh, so, so the cost there is going to be based on the cost of doing an index lookup on S, whatever that cost may be, depending on what index we have. What's our working set size? Two tuples. And is it pipeline? No. Half. Um, all right, what about a sort merge join? And here I'm going to count both the sort and the merge. What's the I.O. cost? So what do I need to do in a sort merge join? What's the first, first step? Sort. All right, so how, uh, how expensive is a sort on um, R, let's say? So R, so I have to sort all of the blocks of R. Um, it's actually a little weirder than that, but let's go, let's keep that for now. Uh, do we have to do uh, any other sorts? Yes. 
All right. Now that we have two sorted relations, what it, what's next? Merge. And what's the cost of that? Uh, say that again. I... OK, so the, then I have to read in all of R again. And I have to read in all of S again. OK, and working set size? Two, three tuples, two tuples as before. Is that for both phases? Not for sorting. So, and what is it pipelined? Yes, but, or yes and yes always. Okay, so phase two. So after it's been sorted, it's uh, it's pipeline. Great. All right. Um, okay. Uh, so let's actually eh. all right so quick show of hands who's encountered a histogram before okay that's uh, so in the last couple of minutes of the class let me move on to a last bit here. So we've so far made a very strong assumption about the data that we've been working with, um, namely that it's distributed according to uniform distribution. Is Now that's a very, very strong assumption. Um, Grade distributions, for example, have a normal curve. Um, age distributions in, in various settings. Data often has uh, a non-uniform distribution. So if we make a uniform assumption, then we're potentially getting it flat out wrong. Let me give you a quick example of this. I have a data set. Oh, oh. There we go. Um, I have a quick example of this. So I've got a bunch of uh, people here. And if I make a uniform assumption on the distribution, uh, I've got this query over here where I'm selecting uh, based on both rank and age. And if I make a uniform assumption then I'm going to end up with uh, I'm going to end up assuming that uh, age accounts for a quarter of my uh, sorry that if I make a uniform assumption then I'm going to uh, get a um, I'm going to end up thinking that age is going to reduce my data set uh, to a quarter of its original size um, so there are uh, four different age values here, um, and I'm looking for one specific age. On the other hand, if I'm looking for uh, rank, well, there are three different ranks, and as a consequence, I'd end up uh, estimating that I pick uh, three-eighths. Uh, I'll get back three-eighths of my data set. So in this particular uh, setting, age is really the best possible thing that I could be uh, asking for. Now, in actuality, in actuality, if I'm asking for an age of 20, well, there's four different people who, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, there are four different people uh, who have an age of 20. So if I'm asking for, 
select name, blah, 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 where uh, age is 20, selecting just on age is going to give me back four values. So if I'm trying to decide which of these two selection predicates uh, to use as my indexing, uh, if I have an index on both age and rank, and I'm trying to figure out which of these two uh, indexes I need to be using, a uniform, uh, a uniform assumption is going to give me that I should be using, uh, that I should be using the age, even though that ends up returning half of my entire data set. So the way that this is um, addressed in a lot of database systems, rather than just having the number of elements and the, uh, the, the upper and lower bounds, what they'll do is actually bucket the data into what's called a histogram. Um, so it's many, and as I've seen, many of you have encountered these before. Uh, the idea is really simple. You take a, uh, you take a count, uh, essentially a group by aggregate, but rather than grouping thing, uh, rather than grouping things on individual values, you bucketize. So if I wanted to bucket based on individual integer ages, I would get this very nice histogram, and I could very easily determine that four values have an age of 21. Uh, that should be 20. On the other hand, I could also do a similar kind of thing where I uh, average these values out. So for example, I could take, uh, a, I could generate a slightly bigger range uh, from 19 to 20, uh, people with ages from 19 to 21 would fall into this bucket. People with ages from 21 to 22 would fall into this bucket. And I'd be able to once again figure out uh, what fraction of my total uh, people fall into each of these two categories. At the very extreme, I end up just creating one bucket and get back to my original uh, uniform uh, estimate. So let's do a quick, uh, a very quick example here. I have the following histogram, and I'd like to estimate the proportion of the people who have uh, where, so this is a histogram on attribute A. I'd like to estimate how many people have, uh, sorry, how many entries have an A of 33. How would I do that? So in this example, uh, how many people have, would have an A of 33? 30. So what does 30 tell me? 30 tells me the number of entries that have, uh, and 30 tells me the number of people between 30 and 40 that have uh, that A value. So how many people would have a specific value between 30 and 40? Three. Okay, so approximate. So I can make a uniform, uh, uniform distribution assumption between 30 and 40. There are 10 different values there. So of the 30 values, I can estimate that three will have an A of 33. What about A is greater than 33? So how, how would I go about doing this? So what would I do with this, uh, this bucket? You break the bucket into two. So things that are less than 33, and things less than or equal to 33, and things that are greater than 33. So 34 and up, how many entries are there? Six or seven, depending on how you count it. Uh, so let's say six, make that a little bit easier. Uh, six entries out of 30 gives us 18 entries. Uh, and then what else do we need to add? Everything else that's greater in the bigger buckets. Okay, so we end up getting an estimate of the total number of uh, tuples that would satisfy this. And that total number is going to be bigger, uh, sorry, more accurate than if we had just uh, used a uniform assumption. Okay. Uh, Cool. So with that, um, thank you, and uh, we'll meet again on Monday. Uh, 
The midterm exam is a week from today. Uh, that snuck up on uh, time flies. So uh, we'll be having a review of, of more or less everything that we've covered uh, on Monday. So, all right.